student level four are testing that majority. Now, I said level four, it's kind of in level four, but it's actually, this is the fifth year of undergraduate study. Uh, it's not that he's failed a year. <laughs> that I did not ask 
on that day that we first met, namely, why should you want to learn this stuff? So it's a pretty uh, obvious question. Why should you want to study uh, arts and science subjects? One pretty bad answer would be, oh, I'm, I, I don't know what else I want to do, therefore I'm indecisive, I should go into art science. Another pretty bad reason, I don't know, weeks later or so, but at least now I believe that I have a framework for understanding so that when I am encountered with new information, it's not just some new information, I can fit it into this model that I've built about how the world works that I've acquired over the past few years. So I'm going to share with you what that mental model is. For me, everyone will have something different because we have different you know, biases and temperaments and dispositions, but, but here's mine. The role of each course. Every course has a part to play that we, that we take in our side. From, from physics and calculus and the other sciences, we can learn about how the universe came into existence and how natural selection shaped all living things, including humans ourselves. From practices of knowledge, West thought and East thought, we can learn about how humans from all types of civilizations and cultures understood their world and made sense of their lives. From writing, logic and statistics, we can learn how to reason logically and statistically, avoiding the fallacies and biases to which the untutored mind is susceptible, and learn how to express complex ideas in writing and speech. From inquiry, we learn about some of the most pressing problems facing the world and just how difficult it can be to solve them. And from economics, we learn how some of these problems can be addressed through governments and markets and other means. From literature, we've learned that literature is not only a source of aesthetic pleasure, but an impetus to reflect on ourselves and have greater empathy. So, that is the general picture, but I'm now going to tell the full story of the history of the world from the universe, the, the, from the Big Bang up until the present day. Uh, the only way to truly understand this story in all of its complexities is to take an art side lens. Uh, and so we're going to start with the Big Bang, and we're going to finish with the arrival of, of humans at about, you know, if the, if the universe were a calendar year, at about 11.54 p.m. on December uh, 31st. So let's, let's get started. So, about 14 billion years ago, everything in the universe was just a hot, dense speck called a singularity that uh, at some finite time in the past just expanded into every direction, and that was the beginning of existence uh, for all intents and purposes. We know this because we have a pretty profound understanding of how the universe works today, from the biggest levels of uh, cosmology to the smallest constituents of the standard model of particle physics. What we can do is just take our equations and run them in reverse, uh, and if you do that for enough time based on some observations we've made about the the, the, the nature of our, of our galaxy and our universe, we can actually know with pretty good certainty how the universe was operating at, you know, in the first second after the Big Bang. It's a, it's a whole long story, I won't tell it all right now. One thing though that is pretty incredible is that we live in a universe that had a Big Bang and it seems to be suitable for life. I mean, we are living proof of that, but that's not a trivial fact. If the mass of an electron, or Planck's constant, or the cosmological constant, or these other numbers that we've measured that fit into our equations were even a smidge different, it's entirely plausible, plausible that our universe would not be hospitable to the formation of life, or even that our universe would not be able to exist at all. It's entirely plausible that there have been an infinite number of universes before our own that have big banged, the conditions weren't perfect, they big crunched, and then big banged again, and then eventually we got this one. Who's to say whether that won't happen to ours too? For the most, uh, for about nine billion years, or on that calendar view, the first seven months of the year or so, things were pretty boring. There's some stars and stuff, but about four billion years ago, uh, a, a piece of stellar, uh, um, a, a star bumped into another star, and the remains formed what we call Earth. And then about half a billion years after that, the first self-replicating molecules showed up. Now this is possibly the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the universe. Molecules that are able to reproduce copies of themselves. Um, and then what happens was, 
How do these molecules make copies of themselves? The ones that are better at making copies of themselves may be because they were able to surround themselves with a cellular wall or code for um, genetics that produced animals that had good camouflage abilities. Those replicators would be able to reproduce copies of themselves and proliferate. And eventually, over time, we had the development of species and increased complexity as uh, entities adapted to suit their environment and adapt to the great complexity. So here you can see uh, in, in, you know, speciation and the development of human life and the development of life in general, including, of course, after uh, a few billion years, the line of chimpanzees and great apes, of which we are just one small branch. So six million years ago, we split off from the common ancestor of chimpanzees, and we evolved with the same, virtually, in most respects, the same bodies and the same brains and the same minds as them. So for in, in most ways, in 99% of the ways that matter, we are no different from the chimpanzees. However, we evolved a very special uh, set of cognitive skills because we evolved in something called the cognitive niche, namely other species are able to solve problems uh, across generations. They kind of figure out how to adapt, but humans, uh, what was selected for in humans is the ability to solve complex problems on the fly. We are able to reason abstractly across a variety of domains. We can build complex mental maps of our environments. We can, uh, we can construct metaphors and communicate in language. This is an extremely valuable and not at all trivial thing that, that the human species was able to evolve that all of our animal predecessors did not have. And from those abilities, the ability to, to reason and speak and construct abstract mental maps, we got from that now in an environment where you know, outwitting a bison is not our main priority, the ability to do mathematics and philosophy and literature and all these things that weren't directly selected for by natural selection, but we are rather fortunate to have the ability to do because of the environment uh, in, in, in which we evolved. Now, we shouldn't be so egotistical as to believe that we are the only type of humans that have ever roamed this earth. Far from it. There have been many, many different uh, species that we would likely recognize if we were to come face to face with them as our genetic cousins. Um, most, uh, our branch of the, the genus Homo, Homo sapiens, have been around for some 75,000 years, but there have been uh, many other species, most notably Homo erectus, who was around for 2 million years. We've only been here for 50,000. They were here for 2 million years using some form of language, they had culture, they had society, they interacted, hunted, and gathered, uh, and now they're gone. We, won't, we have not been here for a fraction as long as they have, and yet we think we're so great. I mean, we are so great in, in many ways, um, but, but you know, we, should, we should maybe be a little bit humble. Um, but then, of course, 50,000 years ago, these behaviorally modern humans evolved. You could go back 50,000 years, just pluck a baby out of anywhere in the world, raise them today, and it would be indistinguishable. You could take someone from a tribe of 50 hunter-gatherers, they were us. Okay, so these early species, these early humans, they were us. They, they painted on the walls of caves. I'm sure you've uh, heard of the Lasso Cave paintings in France. Those are from 17,000 years ago. Even older, just next door in France, are the Chauvet Caves, 35,000 years ago. These are all made by proto-human, I mean humans. These are us, but they wore less fancy clothes. Um, the distance between these two cave paintings is equal to the distance between this second set of cave paintings and today. So we've been around a pretty long time. But why are we special as a, as a species? Many, many, many reasons. Well, we're the only, we're the only species that systematically uh, lights fires on a yearly basis to celebrate the anniversary of our birth. We're the only species that can break a sweat by staring at a small piece of wood. And we're the only species that writes hip hop musicals about other members of our species. Um, these are very unique traits that are distinct, that are distinct to uh, to Homo sapiens. We're also the only species to have systematically conquered the globe. So about 100,000 years ago or so, the, the uh, early, early humans emerged out of Africa and over long stretches of time, tens of thousands of years, eventually made it to basically every hospitable part of the earth because they were problem-solving, adventurous, resourceful people uh, who like to explore, as we do. Um, the thing is, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a problem. Namely, 
the fact that we evolved from you know, apes in a hunter-gatherer environment has left us with some really nasty habits of mind that were extremely valuable back in the day if you're living in a tribe of 100 people picking berries and setting traps. Uh, but in 2017 are doing us no good. So namely, we have a, we have a huge number of, of cognitive biases. And I'm just gonna talk about a few of them right now. One of, one of the worst is called confirmation bias, and it's, it's summarized in this comic. <laughs> I've heard rhetoric from both sides, time to do my own research, the real truth. Google the Holly debated topic, first link, agree with you? Jackpot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> confirmation bias, we are very, very bad at seeking out and believing opinions that disagree with our own, and it makes it really, really hard to change our minds. Now, this was an extremely useful tool in the uh, ancestral environment, because if you're trying to form a cohesive group of people that can work together to solve collaborative problems, you don't really want dissenters and people are gonna be like, hey, can we sit around and, and have a, you know, multi, and do, do an empirical study, you know, a randomized control trial about this? No, you need this. Another really, really pernicious uh, cognitive bias that we've acquired is in-group favoritism and out-group homogeneity. So we really, really like people that are in our in-group. Now, what constitutes your in-group can vary depending on the cultural circumstances that you were raised in. To some, the in-group is my direct family, or my city, or my race, or my country, or my species, or any sentient creature. So what constitutes your in-group might differ based on you know, uh, various factors. Um, and similarly, we, we tend to homogenize the out-group, think that everyone that is not like us, they're all the same, they're all bad. Now, once again, extremely useful if you're living in a small tribe where everyone around you really does want to kill you, not so useful in 2017. Another one that we have is loss aversion. We're extremely sensitive to tiny losses and relative to big gains. So when, when you know, profits are increasing and increasing and then have a small decline like that, we, we tend, to, uh, tend, to, tend, to, tend to freak out. Once again, beneficial if the amount of berries that you have in your stock is the only amount of berries that will let you survive, and if you lose one, you're screwed. Not so beneficial now, especially in a world where bad information can come at us from any possible direction. We can become extremely overwhelmed by negative information and forget to take into account maybe that there's been some increase on the first part of the graph. Okay, those were cognitive biases that we've acquired from our ancestors. Let's go back to the story of human progress. I should talk about maybe what are some of the, we, we, what have we talked about? We, we've gone through physics, biology, some of the hard sciences, uh, evolution. We're now going to move to a more uh, history side of things, history and philosophy. So we're gonna go basically tell the story of human history. Now here's the thing, we think we live in the year 2017. That's just an extremely parochial way of viewing the history of the Earth. Measuring it relative to, to some guy that lived 217 years ago is just, a, is just a kind of a disgrace to the many tens of thousands of years of human civilization that existed far before anything we would recognize uh, as modern. So my proposal is let's consider that we're in the year 1217 and year zero is 12,000 years ago. This paints a much more accurate picture of the history of, of, of human society. So year zero is 12,000 years ago, and the reason is because that's when the first major uh, engineering project of, of, uh, of humanity began. It was a temple in Turkey, and here I've got the, the population of the, of the Earth relative to this big bar is the population of today. Now, I'm actually cheating. The fact that you actually would not be able to see this yellow bar if I were <laughs> truly representing the actual population of the Earth in what I'm calling years ago. So in the year 1000, we have the first major uh, big city in Jericho, in what we now call uh, Israel or the West Bank, and the population continued to increase. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit to the year 4000, the first use of metal. This ushered in what we call the Bronze Age. Uh, the ability to construct more efficient and effective tools led the uh, early people to exploit agriculture to a greater degree. Further domestication of animals led to more bountiful crops, which in turn lead, led to more robust societies. Uh, and it's a kind of a process. The more people that there are, the more people there are to innovate and create new tools. The more tools there are, the more we can support more people. Uh, we continue to the year 5000. We have the first example of pro, what you might call proto writing, when people stopped communicating in emojis and started to use uh, you know, actual textual communication. And in the year 7,000, approximately, I mean, of course, this, I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over huge amounts of important information as one must when you're trying to tell the entire history of human civilization. 
Around the year 7000 is when what we would call the first major civilizations began. And when I say major civilizations, these are uh, full of writing system, complex organizational hierarchies, governments, politics, literature. We've, uh, you, you've probably read the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, that, that, that's around when this is happening. Societies in, in West Africa, in Egypt, in the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, in the Indus Valley. Often these civilizations form on rivers because that's where you could uh, be most plentiful, in China, etc. This is typically where quote unquote history begins. But as you can see, we're 7,000 years past the first, you know, major grouping of people uh, making some, some fancy, you know. Uh, and they, I mean, so around this time is when, when you get, for example, the construction of the pyramids. Um, now I'm going to take a pause because this is where we have the invention of writing to talk a little bit about writing. Uh, because writing is not a trivial thing at all. And as you can see, for most of the history of humanity, we didn't have writing. We had to invent it. Okay. Excuse me. We had to invent it. Now, like agriculture or vehicles, writing is a tool that we invented. Unlike language, which is innate, any human being, if you speak to them, they will pick up your language without you having to teach them anything. Writing is a tool we invented, and you would never put someone, you know, behind the, 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 the wheel of a car or on a, in a tractor plow to do agriculture and just assume that they know how to do it because human tools need to be taught. Whereas, for some reason, there's this unusual notion that people should just be able to write well without really rigorous training uh, and, and, and systematic instruction. The reason is, for, I mean, there are many reasons for this. One is that another really nasty bias that we were left with, which is called the curse of knowledge. As soon as you know something, it's basically impossible to inhabit the mind of a person who doesn't know that thing. And in terms of writing and communicating ideas, this makes it really hard. Because if I have information that I want to share with you, I, it's really hard for me to know what it's like for you to be the person that doesn't know that, as epitomized by this comic of uh, you know, asking for directions, and it's just complete nonsense. Um, so in my opinion, writing ought to be a two-person activity, where you find a person that is equally intelligent as you and someone who you respect, and you show them everything you've written so that they can say, I have no idea what you're talking about, uh, and you respect their opinion. Okay, that was just a brief detour in writing, because it's an arts, of course, so we want to talk about everything. So let's go back to the history of the <laughs> society. Okay, around the year 9500, we have what we would now call Western civilization, which is uh, Greeks uh, who, who did a lot of uh, what, what we learn about in philosophy and uh, early kind of history of science type stuff. Now, it's worth noting that while you know, the Greek civilization was exciting, and Western civilization has been fine, we're still in it, so we're good. Um, we've not been around that long. We've been around for less than 3,000 years. The ancient uh, Egyptian uh, civilization the, uh, was dominant over the world for 3,000 years, longer than we've been around, and Egypt had been well, not a major force since before Western civilization even began. So there have been civilizations that were around for longer than we have, and have already stopped, you know, uh, stopped being dominant forces in the world. We are, we are, we should not be so naive as to suspect that the same fate could not befall us. I mean, we certainly hope not. We think we're, we think we're good and, and good at society and stuff like that. But we need to be careful. It's not necessarily obvious that that you know, our civilization is, is is doing well. Okay, next, um, year ten thousand. We got uh, the, what, some guy, uh, <laughs> just the guy that starts the calendar that we think of as the calendar. No, he was pretty important. Religion is kind of a big deal, and the Roman Empire did have control over most of, you know, many of the people on Earth, so we should give him credit. In the year uh, 10,400, one of the most important inventions uh, in human history is the number zero. This vastly expanded the ability of people to, to uh, reason mathematically and, and do calculations, which uh, really can't be overstated. It was, an, it was an Indian invention that was later brought to the Arab world, uh, and I mean, we now use that Arabic number system, hugely important. Um, one of the other very important inventions was the, the printing press, which allowed literacy to spread to far more people than would have ever been able to read before. We're going to talk about in a second why the spread of literacy is so important for human flourishing. And in the year 1,600, we did something that in this version of the story is absolutely uh, unimaginably incredible. We were the first species to step foot on another astronomical object. I mean, in the context of this narrative of human history, this event uh, 
I don't even want to talk about it. I will just let the framer, <laughs> framer do, the, to do the reaction for me. Okay. Now, here's the thing about this story. It's a very exciting story of human history. One thing about it, though, is that for most of this narrative, for most humans on the Earth, life was not very good, at least by any measure that we would use. How do we know this? Well, we know this mostly because of statistics. We can count um, how many people you know, died of particular causes, or how many people were living under particular circumstances, or what proportion of the Earth at any given time was violently ill. And we can run the numbers and see how does those societies compare to today. For example, I'm, I'm obfuscating the later data, but before you know, the 19th century, if you had a kid, the likelihood of that child living past age five was, was maybe 50%. Okay, every time a woman gave birth, it was just a coin flip whether this kid is going to live to be, uh, you know, even be a child, let alone an adult. So if you were like, I want to start a family, I want to have a family of three, you've got to have a family of six because half of those kids are going to perish. Okay, it's not a very fun story, uh, but that was the world. Another factor is that for most of human civilization, it was extremely likely to perish in violent conflict. Assault, homicide, war. We know this from archaeological data. You can see, you know, markings on bones that tell you how did people die. You know, some of these uh, pre-state societies, there was as much as you know, a 30, 40, 50 percent chance that your cause of death was, you know, bludgeoning. Right now, uh, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's bad. Okay. Um, another one is literacy and education. For most of human history. Most of the world was completely illiterate, totally uneducated. They could not enjoy all of the great literature, music, and art that we reflect on at the time they were living as being so fantastic. It's really quite sad. Um, okay, but, uh, and moreover, there were many practices for most of human civilization that we would look on as just being almost laughable, uh, but certainly morally wrong. Uh, for, in basically every human society, slavery was just the norm. There was no really real discussion over whether that was okay. Practices like breaking at the wheel, where you would attach someone to the arch of a wheel and just kind of beat them with a stick, was a Sunday fun activity that you would take your family to go watch in the city square as they burned cats for entertainment in the in the in the Middle Ages. So, I mean, it was not ideal. Um, you know, the, the death penalty in many parts of the world was granted for you know, crimes like speaking out against the king, not the best. Fortunately, something has happened, and it's wholly underappreciated, namely that on most metrics that I've discussed and we'll be discussing, things have gotten better in a, in a, in a substantial way over, uh, on average, over the course of human civilization. So for example, if we think about child mortality, here's the rest of the graph. Back in the day, 40, 50%, today it's less than 5%. For 95% of the people on Earth, you can be pretty much confident that, that when you have a child, that child will live. Uh, how about um, dying in a violent conflict? This is the important data point right here. The world in 2007, now there are far more people in the world in 2007, but also far, far fewer of those people are, have a probability of dying uh, from, from, from direct violence. It's a sliver compared to some other early societies, and here is, uh, possibly the most astounding, this is literacy and education. In every human society, literacy and education have absolutely soared from the point where um, back in the day, 12% of people on Earth were literate. Now, it's the opposite. Somewhere around 12% people on Earth, of people on Earth are not literate. This is an incredible transformation, and the, the uh, ramifications are huge. Okay. Um, but it's not just those three. We can talk about many metrics. How about um, the, the, the concept of women being granted rights? This is not at all an obvious concept. I mean, we have this concept and want it to be spread. But for most of human society, this is totally non-obvious, uh, which is epitomized by this graph of where women are allowed to vote. Back here, zero countries. Now we're doing much better, and currently one in ten heads of state in the world is a woman, and that number is rising. This is incredible. Life expectancy has absolutely soared. For most people in human society, the concept of living past 30 was just not even a thing that you would ever dream of. Now basically everyone in the world can certainly uh, hope to live past 50, and almost everyone 60, most of the world 70. The global life expectancy is somewhere in the mid-70s.
Um, here's another one for life expectancy. This right here is the life expectancy in 1800. Basically, in every country, you can see this vertical movement, life expectancy has doubled to the point where the poorest people living today can expect to live 10 more years than the richest people living 200 years ago. So across broad scopes of time, things have improved for most people. Health has also improved immensely. Most of the diseases that kill most people, such as polio, we just decided we don't want that anymore. And we invented vaccines and got rid of them. Other diseases will be eradicated. Smallpox is one of two vaccines to be completely eradicated from the face of the earth. Um, the same could befall other terrible diseases like measles, diphtheria, and neglected tropical diseases like guinea worm, which is a horrendous disease that you might have not even ever heard of because we have good medicine and back in the day millions of people were affected now they're about 22 this is on the way out uh what else here's a good one this is the number okay i'm going to go to a video here this is proportion of the earth that is living in extreme poverty so let's see uh oh did that not work did that not work can i not get it uh, oh no it didn't work okay never mind we're good i'll just do this one uh, it, was a, it was a visualization of the proportion of people in the world living in extreme poverty. Uh, needless to say, for most of human history, basically everyone except maybe the king and the king's you know, friends were not living in what we would call extreme poverty, less than a dollar or two dollars per day. If you were born, likelihood you would be. Today, we've reduced it to around 14% of the world. The UN uh, had the target of having global poverty to zero by the year, uh, extreme poverty to zero by the year 2030. That is made, was maybe a little ambitious, but it, 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 the current projections say under 5%. The default state for most of human civilization, extreme poverty, would be befallen to a, but a small fraction and heading down to zero today. It's incredible. Okay, uh, the, 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 probably the more important question though is how did this happen? I mean, it's continuing to happen and it has happened. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important question because when you have this frame on the world, you know, if, if you realize that for most of society, people were poor, the question is not why are people poor, it's why are people rich? This is a, uh, I, it's kind of a miracle. Okay, there are many, 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 many reasons. I can't even begin to cover them all. We cover many of them in inquiry and up, in, in first year inquiry and other inquiry courses. I'm just gonna do a few. Okay, the, one of the concepts here is called the expanding circle. This is, a, this is a concept by the philosopher Peter Singer. It says that over time, our notion of who is in our in-group in the world has expanded. It used to be just our literal hunter got to gather a tribe of 100 people, and we've grown to you know, include our cities and our countries and our states and uh, the world and, you know, and animals now and beyond and who deserves rights. The thing is, once you acknowledge that other people are in your circle of empathy, it's really hard to kill them or not allow them to vote. Uh, and so we kind of are faced with these moral contradictions where we have to you know, ex expand rights. So what are some ways that this happened? Well, one is well-reasoned arguments. We cannot dismiss the importance of philosophy in, in, in moral progress. Because when people point out, you know, oh, this practice is wrong, it sits, it does not sit well with us to know that we have a contradiction in the way we're living our lives. So, um, I mean, I'm a, I, I enjoy the Enlightenment, so I'm gonna pick some Enlightenment philosophers, but there are so many others. Uh, for example, here's a totally not obvious concept, that the punishment for your crime should be proportional to the severity of the crime. We think of that as obvious, totally non-obvious for most of human history, until you make an argument like, for a punishment to achieve its objective, it's only necessary that the harm it inflicts outweighs the benefit that derives from the crime. Everything beyond that is superfluous, therefore tyrannical. Okay, Cesare Beccaria, that was an argument that was put forth in the use of reason. People were convinced, and we now you don't get the death penalty for you know, stealing a loaf of bread. How about slavery? Slavery is pretty obvious, right? Well, no, you need to construct a well-reasoned argument to explain why slavery is bad. Uh, namely, I'll just read the last line here, freedom of nature is to be owed no other restraint but the law of nature. The idea that there's a law of nature, that human rights, that just by being alive, you have certain rights that people cannot take from you, totally non-obvious. It took philosophers to come up with these really difficult ideas. I mean, I'm using difficult somewhat facetiously because we think of this as completely obvious, but you know, if you traveled back you know, a thousand years ago and tried to explain this, they would, they would think you were kind of ludicrous. Um, what about, and then another process is taking these 
uh, uh, this language that is used to justify one barbaric practice and translate it to another. So, for example, if you can't, if it's unethical to be a slave uh, in society, why is it unethical for a woman to be slave to her husband? If men are born free, how is it that women are born slaves? As they must be, if being subjected to being constant, uncertain, the unknown, arbitrary will of man will be the perfect condition of slavery. So this is another philosopher uh, using reason to explain why a practice is wrong. Here's one more. This is about animal rights. The question is not can they think, nor can they reason, but can they suffer? Once you say that, we are supposed to account for all suffering entities. Uh, it becomes really hard to factory farm a cow. And yet, well, we do it anyway. But. We'll talk about that. Okay, now, good reasons uh, need to be read by people. You can't just have a good reason and then publish it and then the you know, academics you know, sit around the table and nod and then everyone's happy about it. This information needs to spread in one of the best ways, uh, probably the best way throughout most of uh, civilization was through literature. Um, the improvement of liter literacy worldwide, the reason that it's so crucial is that more people have access to the ability to read other people's perspectives on life, uh, which allows them greater empathy, it's a source for self-reflection, and it causes you to open your mind to experiences that you didn't know existed. Once you've read a, you know, a first-person narrative or a work of fiction like some of these that I have on the screen, it becomes really, really difficult to tolerate some of the practices that these books have uh, sought to call out and address. Um, I mean, they're, they're well, I can't talk about all of them. Uncle Tom's Cabin was kind of a watershed for the, for the US Civil War. Many people, after reading that book, it was kind of a call to arms. They kind of realized that they, they took up the cause of, of um, abolition, even though, of course, arguments for slavery had existed long, long before. Uh, even now, television shows are a huge driver of empathic change. There is good reason to believe that um, the super rapid progress from the decriminalization of homosexuality to not that long after the legalization of gay marriage uh, that shows like Will and Grace actually accelerated that change because more people were able to see a perspective that they might not have been able to see before and, and, and were able to accept that, that kind of practice. Okay, one other reason, and there's, there are too many, but this is the best one. In my, this is the one I study because it's what I love. Science. Science is possibly, it might be real and have the real ability to affect tangible change in the world. Um, all those health outcomes, much of it has been because of vaccines. Um, electricity has brought huge advances to the world. The Green Revolution has brought food to many billions of people who otherwise would have gone hungry. And the internet has ex helped expose us to viewpoints that, that of, of the types of people that we would never really have even acknowledged existed or were suffering or you know, we should be paying attention to. And even just the idea of science, just the idea that any person should just be allowed to float an opinion, test a hypothesis, and that you're not going to get, you know, uh, berated or, or shut down. If someone has a better uh, hypothesis, they can test that too. And we just have this, you know, free, this idea of a free exchange of ideas, uh, hypothesis and reputation. It's ridiculous and it's allowed us to understand how the world works to a degree that really no one can, can truly understand. There are many, so many other reasons, democracy, international cooperation, trade, the UN, whatever. It's all fun. Okay, however, this is very optimistic, it's very rosy, but this is not at all, you should not take this as a reason to be complacent. In fact, quite the, quite the opposite. Once you, once you, in seeing the world in this way, you realize that not all of the graphs are going in the right direction, right? Uh, many of them are not. In fact, many of the reasons that many of those previous graphs were able to go in the right direction is because of other things that went in the wrong direction. So for example, so here's, a, here's a graph that is most certainly not going in the right direction, a global CO2 emissions, major problem. We should not be complacent here. Here's another one, mass incarceration in the United States, uh, a, a, a practice uh, that will likely be looked on as equally barbaric as some of the practices that I was describing from the Middle Ages. Uh, the number of globally displaced refugees and uh, unsheltered people, this once again is a, is a complete you know, tarnish on the modern uh, you know, moral map. There are many, many others. I'm a personal fan of, uh, a fan. I think about factory farming as one that is, uh, will, will be regarded by future generations as really, really bad. So this is not a reason to be complacent. However, it's a reason to believe that it's possible to 
make change, right? Often, before, before learning a lot of this information, I often thought, you know, oh, global poverty, what's the point? What can I do? But once you see that, actually, look what the point is, that graph is going to 4.5%. If we just keep identifying the factors that push that line down and keep pushing them harder, that graph might go to zero. So to me, it's actually a reassuring call to arms of, look, we can actually make very positive change in the world because it's happened already. So here are just a couple of causes that I've cared about that I'm just going to share with you. One is effective altruism. And that's the question of, you want to do good in the world, uh, but what is the most effective way you know, that you can give each minute or each dollar of your time to help the most people? So say you want to help uh, poverty, you know, a, a good example of an unaffected solution is to go there over, you know, go somewhere over March break and uh, build a, an eighth of a house and then take a new profile picture. A really effective way is to give your money to um, vetted charities that have been ranked by charity evaluators to do the most you know, per person good. Another one is climate change. You could maybe buy a new car, but then you realize that if you actually dig deep, vehicle emissions are only a fraction of the total emission. What does most of the damage is the agricultural industry. You can actually make a better impact by eating one less hamburger a week than you can by trading in for a, a, an electric vehicle. Okay, so that's effective altruism. How can we make effective changes uh, that do good, maybe not just feel good? Uh, another is um, po political polarization and scientific literacy. So we are in an era of very strong political polarization, and scientific literacy is not at its best in the world. Um, well, sorry, I should rephrase that. It is at its best on a historical standpoint. More people are educated in science than have ever been before, but it's not at the you know, it, we could be doing better. Um, one uh, project is called Cultural Cognition. It says that people form their beliefs not by sitting there and you know, taking classes and reasoning through the world, but most of most people's beliefs come about because the people that they like and trust believe the same things. That is certainly the case for me and climate change. When I came to university, I thought that climate change was real. I had not taken any courses in environmental science. Why? It's because people I like and trust believe in climate change. Unless you've taken courses in this stuff, the same is probably true for you too. How can I blame someone whose you know, trusted elders are climate change deniers or don't believe in vaccines if that person you know, is skeptical of those practices as well? So this is a really, really challenging problem to address, and it's at the intersection of uh, psychology, philosophy, sociology, politics, law, political science. It's a huge big topic of how we can you know, effectively convince people uh, of stuff. And another one, I'm just going to quickly explain uh, this graph, is political polarization. Understanding that people's psychological predispositions lead them to holding lead them to hold vastly different uh, political beliefs about what is right and wrong in the world. So just quickly, uh, politically liberal people care a lot when they decide about what is right, about harm and fairness. They want to reduce those things. But politically uh, conservative people tend to care more broadly about more factors. Not only is harm and fairness important, but what's also important is maintaining a sense of authority, in-group loyalty, and purity. Once you understand that people's psychological dispositions lead to their beliefs, you become, and I can explain this, uh, attest this personally, much, much less angry when people disagree with you and you understand, I'm, I don't, not only do I know what you believe, I understand why you believe it, now we can have a real conversation and you're much more open to, to changing your mind and, and, and that kind of thing. So these are just some things that have interested me. Okay, let's conclude. The most important, the most impressive part of this whole story, okay, is that, yes, this happened, everything I'm telling you happened, but the most important part is that we, we, we did it. Like, it didn't just happen because it happened. It happens because people did it, like us, like in this room, we all did it. We should take credit for all the good stuff that I've been talking about. Historians, literature scholars, archeologists, paleontologists, anthropologists, and linguists constructed the entire history of our world from the first humans to the present day. It's not obvious that we have history. They actually did it. They got the information and learned about human history. Physicists discovered the structure of our universe from the tiniest particles down to the, up to the Big Bang. Biologists cracked the mystery of evolution, explaining why we exist as a species. Medicine gave us vaccines and treatments. Philosophers, legal scholars, and others gave us an understanding of rights and justice and morality. And that work was carried out by novelists and diplomats and politicians and journalists and economists and business people. Uh, you know, statisticians were able to make sense of 
uh, trends in, in world history to identify what is and is not going well. We, it actually happened because a bunch of people who were curious and loved learning and wanted to solve problems, like us, the people in this room, were like, what can we do to help? And then they did it, and then it worked. It's, re it's really incredible. I firmly believe that we should be having parades every single day, just Monday, vaccines, Tuesday, history, Thursday, human rights, just celebrating all the incredible stuff that's going on in the world. And we should be extremely fortunate that we get to, we get to live in this time where we have the opportunity to, uh, to appreciate and understand all of this. So that's it. Thank you. So how do we, uh, other scientists and historians, know populations of humans throughout a big history? Oh, and the, and oh, was it models and it, mathematical models and yeah, anthropology? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mathematical models, archaeological evidence um, in literature. So for example, you can tell what the population was in past times from historical literature. Um, the Bible has a lot of, you know, you can kind of source information from those kind of religious documents about how many people were living at a given time. Um, but pre-writing, it's like, it's mathematical models and bones. Do, do, do those models tell us anything about the dispersion of humans? So, because writing will tell us like, okay, so this city or this empire had a lot of people, yeah. but can it tell us were there more people living outside cities, say rurals, than people living in cities? Do we know what was happening in places that didn't have lit like literature when oh. the Roman Empire was at its height? That's a good question. I am not well versed <laughs> enough in history to know how that type of research works. So I unfortunately cannot answer the question. <laughs> um, of all the cognitive biases we've talked about, which one do you think people should be most aware of and like, take steps to look for? Oh, I would say. Oh yes, which, but the question was, which cognitive bias is the worst and which should we actively take steps to avert? In my opinion, confirmation bias. I think that it's really, really easy. We live in a, we live in a, uh, a, you know, a, a world where you can go on the internet, get, get thousands of opinions that agree with your own, and leave the day happy thinking that you are correct about everything. That's a really, really big problem. I mean, when, I know that when I log into Facebook, 95% of what I see is just like, yes, you, you tell them. Uh, and that's really, really bad. So one thing that I've done to personally combat that bias is I've started um, watching YouTube videos and following on Twitter people that I explicitly disagree with, people whose views I think are just wrong and sometimes abhorrent. Um, but, you know, intellectuals, I'm not, you know, uh, that high level people engage with the best arguments from the other side, and after enough time, once you kind of get used to the psychology of that way of thinking, it becomes less like, oh, you tell them, and more like, let's talk about this, you know? Uh, so I would say that in, in 2017, that's probably the most important cognitive bias to, to mitigate. Cool. So, Bill, I guess building a bit on that question, you talked a lot about how it's difficult for us to change our mind. Yes. What is something that you have changed your mind about recently? Oh, no, oh, that's, that's a really good question. Well, one of them, one of them, uh, well, okay, um, I mean, I can do this across different um, time scales. In one, one thing that I changed my mind uh, after coming to uh, arts and science was, um, you know, that these global issues that we learned about in inquiry, I'll just tell the story. When I, when I was angry on the first day, we watched, we watched a movie, uh, uh, and it painted a, a rather bleak picture, and it made me sad. Uh, and, and my gut reaction, I was like, all right, well, I guess we're screwed in the world. Um, so what, that's definitely one thing that I changed my mind about, understanding that if we contextualize you know, many problems through a broad history of, of, of progress, then we can make a change. More recently, I would say I changed my mind about, uh, because you know, I mentioned factory farming, I stopped uh, eating meat, uh, a year ago, that's something I changed my mind about. I decided that that practice was unethical. Um, because of this polarization stuff, I changed my mind that um, 
uh, that politically conservative ideas were just wrong. It was just, you know, it was just, it was just liberal and wrong. And I don't know. <laughs> Um, you mentioned about, um, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but educating like people that are have been influenced shaped by the culture. Yes. So, like, for example, if you were to teach them something, but then wouldn't that be suggested that one type of knowledge is true? So, for example, if you were teaching like a religious community about evolution, that would be kind of imposing one truth over a different truth that they believe, right? Isn't that well, that is certainly true of um, of more subjective. Problems, right? So you know, um, teaching you know, um, certain, uh, for example, trying to impose you know religious beliefs onto other people's beliefs or like one form of government onto other people. But when it comes to you know purely empirical beliefs such as evolution, where you know, I mean, it's just it, it, there's no other truth when it comes to evolution. It's just evolution is the true. <laughs> We, I mean, we know evolution is true as truly as we know any other true fact about the world. Um, so, in that regard, you know, you, you, you can't just blanketly impose beliefs and views onto other groups of people. But there is some notion of, you know, uh, I mean, uh, evolution is, you know, um, it, it's, 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 it's a formative idea. I think climate change is a better example. Because if we accept that climate change is true, you know that 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 then it's not just good enough. We can't say okay, it's true, and then stop. We have gotta do something about it. Evolution is not quite like that. You don't have to do anything about it once you know that evolution is true. But other you know true problems, uh, you kind of have to do something about it. So if you don't believe in it, well, that's a practical problem because you might get flooded or you know glacier melted on, uh, and that is a, a vast issue. I would say. Yeah. Yes. Um, global, globalization, does it work? Will it work, or what are its oh, that's, limits? That's, see, that's a gigantic question. That's, that's, like, that's like a five-year degree. That's like a five-year degree's worth of a question. What's, so your, what's, I, what's your opinion of of where we are right now with it? I think that well, I think it's a very nuanced issue. Globalization has uh, many benefits, including uh, a decline in violence. If you do more trade with more people. Um, it becomes much harder to, to you know, want to, there, there's a quote about like, you know, um, I don't want to bomb Japan again, not because I have any particular good feelings toward the Japanese, but because they made my day again, you know? That's a good argument for like, why globalization is good. If you're forced to do trade with more people, uh, you, you, you see, you know, that, 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 uh, that there's a decline in war. And that there's many, there are many good graphs, so here's a, that's fine. Here's interstate war. So interstate war, wars between two countries are on the on the on the out and out. Okay, well we we should cross our fingers that they will continue to be on the out and out. But at the moment they are they are really on the decline. Um, because in order to have an interstate war, you know, only two people need to disagree. The heads of state of both the heads of states of both countries. And when you have something like the UN, where all countries get together, and you have to look at the other you know, head of state in the eye, it becomes much, much harder to have a war with them, especially if they provide you with their bananas and you provide them with their oil or whatever. So in, that's one advantage. There are many, many, many uh, disadvantages. Uh, joblessness, yeah, I, I would say particularly increased in income inequality, vast levels of inequality, lots of bad stuff. Okay, we okay. have time for two more quick questions. Um, No, 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 it's good, it's good. The main thing, the main thing is that I would say that coming into ArtSci, a lot of the stuff is not stuff that I was, I was not as interested in most of these topics coming in. Uh, but gradually, I mean, as you take you know, all of the courses, 
And as you read more and more independently and you pursue what you're interested in, uh, it's really sweet. One thing that is good in art side is that because a lot of art side classes are kind of Basically, you can write whatever you want. No, what I mean is in the sense of like, there's no. What I mean, what I mean by that is there's no prescriptive. You must write an essay about a particular topic. It's, it's you must write an essay about a book. It's like okay, then that's where, that's where they're high level. You know, you can pursue you can pursue what you are interested in within the framework of art science. So that's why I said that you know every person's version of this lecture will be very different. You know what I mean? This is just the stuff that, through ArtSci, I've been interested in, and then I've been able to write you know, essays and stuff and do projects about these particular topics. Uh, yours will be probably vastly different, and maybe you will give this lecture in three years on uh, why the world is, has gotten worse across the <laughs> <as much> <laughs> So, first of all, I would say that the fact that you think that you're going to change your mind, but you think that everyone else isn't, that's a big no-no. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't mean to call you out specifically. I just mean that everyone has the sense, everyone has the sense in their head of like, man, look at everyone out there with their biases. <laughs> uh, so, so, so. I spend a lot of my time thinking about my biases. Yeah, that's good. So, but the thing is, I, was, I talked for a reason, then I talked about things like literature. I mean, there's no, you know, when you write a book about why something's bad? You don't lay out the step-by-step -step argument. There's a there's a metaphor that that, that human reasoning is we, we have a that the mind is like an elephant, and the, the elephant of the mind is gonna go wherever it's gonna go, and you, the logical reasoner, are the rider on the elephant. So what you can do is kind of steer it in one direction, but if you're you know, if your emotional elephant is gonna go in a particular direction, there's not really much you can do about it. But the way that you change that is there's many ways to do it. One of them is you change the path. You don't allow people to have wrong beliefs because society is structured in such a way that it's just totally inconvenient to, uh, to believe something, you know? Um, so uh, there's a field called behavioral economics that it, it, you know, uh, teaches about how we can incentivize people to make decisions. But another one is just, it's just through emotion. Making people you know, feel um, bad about stuff is a great way to get them to change their minds about it. There's, there's definitely uh, no, no shame in that. Reason can only go so far. Uh, I completely agree with you. It's a limited tool, but a powerful one. Well, I'm going to um, cut things off yes. um, officially um, so that we can um, have time for open refreshments informally to uh, continue the discussion. So please, by no means, think you have to depart now. Um, there's so many. I mean, it's just wonderful being here and and looking out at everyone. Right. Yes. Um, so, uh, so please stay and um, continue to discuss, discuss the challenge um, and, um, uh, and socialize. So thank, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Madeline, for an incredible uh, lecture. And, um,